Does your family ever get exasperated with you for stockpiling such things as paper towels, bottled water, or toilet tissue? Well, they certainly can't object to you stockpiling money. Silver, the only money recognized by the U.S. Constitution. And your first 10-ounce bar of pure silver can be had at spot price with no premium by going to sdbullion.com rp. And when you buy it that way, you'll be supporting reluctant preppers as well by going to sdbullion.com rp. Thanks. This is a quick update to thank you for building our number of patrons to 70 and growing on patreon.com slash reluctant peppers. Soon, when we reach 100 active patrons, we're going to start sending out a one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle each and every month to one active subscriber. So you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant peppers. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're glad to have this returning guest. He's only been with us a couple of times before. His name is Jim Rawls, and he is the founder and senior editor of Survival Blog, the originator of the American Redoubt Movement, and the co-creator of CFAPA.org, an organization that issues free press credentials to any adult citizen. He served as a late Cold War era Army intelligence officer. He wrote for several magazines and has worked as a technical writer. He now lives in a fairly self-sufficient life on a cattle ranch that is an in-holding inside a national forest in the northern Rockies. His daily blog, survivalblog.com, is considered a standard reference on family preparedness with archives stretching back for more than 12 years. Jim, thanks for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Thanks for having me on. We wanted to circle back with you on a topic that we just scratched the surface of when you were here the first time, and that is what in the world is the American Redoubt Movement, and why have you chosen a particular area of the country uh, for its characteristics? What were the guiding principles that led you to recommend that particular area as being suitable for families seeking uh, greater independence and uh, safety and self-reliance? And what do you see as a future of that, uh, that in recent developments in that movement? So could you kind of walk us through that? And, sure. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, I chose the region that I refer to as the American Redoubt uh, for several reasons. Uh, first, it's geographical isolation from major population centers. Uh, the American Redoubt consists of three states and parts of two others. And the, those three states are Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, and then the eastern half of Oregon and the eastern half of Washington. And again, the main consideration was geographic isolation, but just below that on my list of priorities is energy self-sufficiency. The Inland Northwest is blessed with a tremendous amount of hydroelectric power. It's a power exporting area, and it'll only be regions like that that I, I believe the power grids will likely stay up in the event of a major uh, disaster that would otherwise bring them down. Now, there, of course, is the outlying possibility of either an EMP strike sure. or a massive solar flare, yep. and that would bring down all power grids, and uh, at most, you might have um, local power restored in just very, like, like the immediate area around a, a hydroelectric dam, just a few miles, perhaps. Uh, but other than that, those type of situations, I think that the, the inland northwest is just about ideal for self-sufficiency. It has a mix of timber and agriculture. It, again, it has very light population density. Yep. It's well removed from major population centers. Uh, it has a moderate climate, very plentiful water, and a just an outstanding quality of life in general, uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis. Back when you talked about energy independence, um, is the idea that a lot of the other parts of the country are dependent upon coal-fired or uh, natural gas-powered or nuclear power plants, that kind of thing that require basically supply chains bringing, 
bringing exactly. uh, raw materials there? Right. Uh, with hydroelectric power, all it requires is very minimal staffing to keep the turbines running and to keep that portion of the grid up. And most of the local uh, power cooperatives are, are already set up to island their power. Islanding is where if the national grid goes down, local grids will come back up. And a lot of these are, are configured to come back literally in a matter of moments after the, the failure of, say, the western grid or the eastern grid. And I feel really blessed to live in an area where they're ready to island the power. And I don't think that most of the rest of the country is in near that situation. Uh, there are a few areas uh, where there are a lot of natural gas-powered uh, plants, like in uh, northern New Mexico, for example, or, or uh, southwestern Colorado, where they are already set up to island power, where they're also power exporters, not importers. Okay. Um, but other than that, uh, there aren't too many other areas outside of the Pacific Northwest and the Inland Northwest that have a good chance of having their power go unscathed. So you mentioned population density, energy independence, uh, water accessibility of large uh, quantities of uh, of water that's good enough for either drinking or, or agriculture, and right. uh, you also mentioned uh, agricultural that uh, I think that, that you can grow uh, uh, the the climate is suitable for growing. Um, anything any other guiding principles that led you to those particular areas? Well, part of it was uh, along with a low population density, uh, most of these regions have a very conservative. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to mention that, <laughs> especially yeah. when you pictured <laughs> when you mentioned the eastern half of uh, Washington and Oregon. You got that's where I started thinking along those lines. Yeah, uh, in fact, I think it's of any part of the country that's likely to have a a partition of a state that's that's successful. Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington probably have the highest chance because they have so little in common with their counterparts west of the Cascades. And uh, the politics are already very favorable in the American readout, and they're getting more favorable with every passing day because so many like-minded people are moving here. Yeah, that's a trend we hoped you could weigh in on um, because you, you had defined this area uh, years ago, and I just wondered if you could f give us an update on how things are progressing because you basically put out an invitation to people you said folks this is why I'm suggesting that people who are like-minded uh, about self-reliance independence that kind of thing uh, consider relocating here and I'm wondering what what you're seeing in, in terms of uh, follow-through on that well it's very hard to put a number on it uh, because by their very nature uh, preppers tend to be very perspicacious and private Mm -hmm. They're not going to sign up on some roster of newly arrived American redoubters. Mm -hmm. But um, just, you know, apocryphal evidence and, and you know, non-scientific evidence leads me to believe that people are arriving here in very large numbers. The real estate agents all are telling me the same thing, that people are specifically coming here uh, because they read about the American redoubt and they are looking for particular types of properties here yeah. that are self-sufficient, ones that have either preferably gravity-fed spring water yeah. or a, a spring somewhere on the property or a well that they can pump from. Um, people are looking for particular types of properties, but they're arriving in large numbers, and a lot of uh, conservative and libertarian Christians and Jews pr predominantly. Mm. I, I had to smile because uh, when my wife and I were researching a particular county in Minnesota when we lived there outside the Twin Cities that had uh, very high clarity uh, lakes, very high water quality lakes and uh, timber and uh, minimal parcel size uh, restrictions and that sort of thing. Uh, I remember talking to the town clerk of one of these townships and she you could just hear her, si hear her sighing on the phone on the other side saying, because I started asking about these minimum parcel sizes and that sort of thing. She said, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. She says, everybody wants to move here and nobody wants to live near anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I wasn't the first person that had called her and asked some of those same questions that, that she, other people have been asking her as well. That, um, that's typical. Yeah. 
So you, in, in describing that, you mentioned some of the additional, uh, kind of zooming it down from the sort of the regional level down to the, down to the individual property level, some of the, some of the characteristics that uh, you've recommended and that uh, many do consider ideal uh, aspects of the amenities or the, na the natural resources that you'd find on an ideal location. Could you continue down that vein? What other things uh, would be, people be wise to look for when looking for their ideal uh, location to site their new uh, their home? Well, um, I would recommend that people, uh, first, if they are um, believers in a particular religion, look first for a church home. And then, after they found a church home, they should look um, for a place that's in a reasonable driving distance of that church for their retreat property. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer in having someone live year-round at their intended retreat rather than uh, living in the city and then planning to bug out at the right. 11th hour to right. a retreat property. I think that's a, a, it's foolish to do that. And unless someone is absolutely forced by their job situation or um, family dynamics, whether it's the the health of a, a family member or whatever, that they go ahead and make the move. And ideally, someone, of course, should either be self-employed or retired to be able to do that. I don't recommend moving somewhere and starving. But um, in terms of what to look for in a property, I would say there's essentially two, two approaches. One is to essentially hide yourself from any likely lines of drift for uh, looters or refugees in yeah. the event of a disaster. Mm -hmm. So for that, you would want to find a property that is literally on the side road of a side road and preferably landlocked inside of a larger parcel where you just have a, a right-of-way lane uh, going uh, back into your, your parcel back inside of a much larger farm or ranch. That would be ideal. Now, not everyone's going to be able to find that, but uh, that's the kind of isolation that, that you're looking for. Plan B would be to move into uh, the city limits or, or within the, the confines of a small town. And then there you would be, depending on the neighborliness and the strength of, in numbers of that small town, to take on all comers. And to have any sort of cohesiveness for that, you really need to have a town that has no more than a, a population of 1,500. Uh, ideally, it should be under 1,000. Hmm. Once you get larger than that, then unfortunately, you, the, the whole we-they paradigm tends to break down. And unless you have a real strong sense of the we, uh, you're not going to keep the, the they out of the town. It's interesting how we seem as humans to be descended with uh, uh, millennia of practice at this sort of this tribalism like you're talking about. That just that comes naturally to us, that idea that the people that we know uh, well and that we see often are the people that we then uh, learn to trust and that learn right. to trust us. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a neo-tribalist, but I do see a lot of wisdom in uh, a, a tribal sort of community. And that level of, or that, well, I should say that size of community, you need to have a, a minimum number of people in the community to be able to carry on a normal civilization. You need to have, you know, doctors, you need to have carpenters, plumbers, you need to have a lot of people in, engaged in agriculture, for example. So unless you have at least 50 or 100 people, you're probably not going to be able to make a go of it. But again, if you get more than about 1,500 people, things may just come unraveled. If we could turn our attention to trends you see in the, great, in the broader society and okay. the global society, um, You've been at this for some time now. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your in our intro, we mentioned that you've got archives stretching back 12 years. So you've been not only interested in this topic, but you've been a leader in coordinating 
uh, and uh, be a focal point for communications of people and the thought in this area for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you've, you're an avid student of, of what is actually developing, what's actually coming true that you've had the foresight and others that you've worked with have had the foresight to uh, predict and to anticipate and uh, ahead of it's actually unfolding. So could you share with us just in the past year maybe some uh, of the main uh, trends or developments that seem to be in your mind key and uh, critical for people to be aware of when you know looking for an understanding of things that are confirming what's really going on and the way things are, are really heading, the way the situations are really developing in our world? Certainly. Um First and foremost, I think the last year, uh, certainly with the election of Donald Trump, has brought into sharp focus the fact that our society is becoming increasingly polarized. Uh, more now than ever, we see the divide between the urban coastal elites and the interior uh, a, a sharp division that's becoming sharper with every passing day, where politically, socially, morally, religiously, we have less and less in common between those two uh, uh, groups that are almost to the point of being antithetical. I have and, to ask you, while you're just on that one point, I have to ask you, do you believe that it is that the situation is as stark in that dimension as it's portrayed in the mainstream media and, and the popular media or do you feel that that aspect has been accentuated or emphasized um, to the point the of over overstating it in, in the, 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 pol media? the political side of it has been overemphasized the moral component has been underemphasized All right. I think that um, the divide between uh, people who are uh, pro-abortion versus pro-life is greater than ever before. The divide uh, between people who have a traditional view of marriage versus the anything goes definition of marriage is certainly greater than ever before. And the Obergefeller uh, decision uh, maybe brought that into uh, more public discourse, but the divide was there, and it's I think it's stronger than ever before. So, from the from a moral standpoint, I think the the divide is actually underreported. From a from the political dimension, I think it's slightly overreported because there's so much emphasis on the never Trumpers and the anti Trumpers mm -hmm. uh, versus the you know. <laughs> The Trump or diehards. Yeah. So, uh, but all all in all, I would say the divide is uh, more profound than it's been since 1865. Hmm. Okay, so that is a major trend: is is uh, divisiveness within the population of our country itself. Okay. What other yes. What other trends are you observing? Uh. In terms of demographics and immigration, I think that it's quite clear that uh, with the low U.S. birth rate, that the impact of foreign immigration is going to be more clearly felt in the next 15 to 20 years. And again, the divide will pre predominantly be a urban versus rural divide because most of the immigrants are going to end up in urban areas. So that's a, a major component. Uh, and there's there's a lot of, you know, for every macro trend, there's a lot of micro trends as well. Uh, and I, I'm not sure we have the time to go into all of them uh, in this interview. But keep in mind that the same folks who have an antithetical view to ours have a entire laundry list of hot button issues that they want to address that they want to institute what they call social justice mm -hmm. or and where they want to institute legislation 
or um, street actions, as they call them, riots, or um, expropriation of property. They have a huge laundry list of things they want to do. And right near the top of their list, presently, is attempting to disarm the populace. And as I pointed out recently in my blog, it's a mathematical impossibility. And I think that the uh, the statists, leftists, and collectivists need to just get over it because they're never going to get our guns. You know, it's interesting because we've had, uh, I believe it was uh, Brad Harris from Full Spectrum Survival on it. He talked about the end game of disarmament and how um, unceasing the pressure, the unrelenting the pressure has been uh, from those who are favoring disarmament and how every uh, situation that, that comes up, whether it's, you know, you hear so many different theories on whether these things are manufactured situations or whether they're just jumping on a crisis that actually did happen, um, are uh, basically exploited to the extreme uh, to maximize the impact of either new legislation or restrictions and that sort of thing to, to force the eventual... Um, basically, if not disarmament, then at least uh, illegalization, you know, dis, uh, uh, making it I illegal to be, pra to be practically, you know, useful, using a gun or that sort of thing, uh, <laughs> firearms for your family. Uh, what gives you confidence that it's, you mentioned you wrote recently, on it, what gives you confidence that that's a fruitless effort? Well, the sheer numbers. Uh, my personal estimate on the number of privately owned firearms in the United States is 400 million. And that's substantially higher than the official tally that came out of the BATF. But a lot of their tallies are based on transfers through federally licensed dealers. Okay. The vast majority of guns haven't passed through dealer hands in more than 20 or 30 years in this country. Uh, the vast majority of guns uh, are fully opaque to federal officials. And that actually gives me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling to know that they don't know where they are, mm -hmm. nor even how many there are. And the estimate on the number of AR-15s, for example, I, I put at uh, somewhere close to 20 million. So, um, or, or a well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say just AR-15s. Uh, detachable magazine semi-automatic rifles mm -hmm. is around 20 million which is a huge number it, it vastly larger than our standing army controls vastly larger than the national guard controls vastly larger than the police control and the majority of those have no positive tracking which again makes me feel quite good so they're, they're never going to be able to find them, uh, even if they were to ban them and issue a general amnesty and offer everyone $1,000 a piece for them. I really doubt that, that, that more than 40 or 50 percent of them would be turned in. Yeah. And if you look at the just the absolute fi abject failure of uh, attempts at disarming a, a civilian populace like they had with the... Um, legislation in Canada 15 years ago, uh, as they've gradually done in England, as they did uh, in one radical step in Australia uh, more than a decade ago, the numbers there have all been uh, below 50% compliance. All right. And here in the United States, where we have a populace that's notoriously independent and stubborn, I think the level of compliance might be below 20 or 30 percent. All right. So in addition to um, immigration and uh, disarmament and uh, a shift of uh, s uh, sort of subdivision of the of the uh, culture uh, geographically and uh, urban versus versus interior, that sort of thing. What other trends do you see that, that are confirming or significant to you that you think are going to play into what our future uh, is shaped by? I would say the uh, increasing uh, division of labor and uh, the technological transformation of our society, where now fully 95% of the population carries around a smartphone every day. That's something that 10 years ago would have been 
unthought of. Ten years ago, a cell phone was almost still a novelty. Mm-hmm. Now it's an, considered a necessity by most people. So that level of technological adoption and even technological dependence plays into a lot of prepper scenarios. And I, I believe that as people are increasingly dependent upon communications technology and indirectly the power grid, um, when whenever that's disrupted, dis- disrupted, I think it will cause a tremendous, almost uh, schizic uh, break uh, <laughs> where... Uh, I think that people will have a almost a mental collapse if they are deprived of their, you know, Facebook and whatever. I don't even use social media. All the different social media toys they play with, and instant connectivity through messaging or text. I guess they use texting now rather than um, instant messenger. Uh, uh, part my lack of familiarity with some of this, but I don't live in cell phone country. I live way beyond. <laughs> I, have to drive, I, have to drive, I have to drive 30 miles to get a cell phone signal. I, I had an acquaintance uh, where I worked who said when he was looking for a change of life in his career, he said, I'm, I'm deciding that if I leave here, what I'm going to do is just keep on driving and driving and driving until I can't get a cell signal and then drive about another hour and then I'll stop there and find a place to live. <laughs> <laughs> so again, yes, uh, to, to backpedal a bit, I think that the level of dependence on technology is going to continue to increase and the, the level of sophistication of that technology, unfortunately, makes it increasingly vulnerable with every passing day. I may have mentioned in my last interview that the gate sizes on microcircuits is getting smaller and smaller and sure. smaller. Uh, it's down, right now down to about two-tenths of a micron. I can remember uh, 15 years ago when I was writing for a defense publication, they were talking about the, the amazing uh, prospect of ha- having sub-micron gates. Well, now they're down to two-tenths of a micron. And unfortunately, the smaller the gate size, the more vulnerable a microcircuit is to upset or just plain getting completely fried mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. Uh, something as simple as static electricity or by EMP or solar flare. So we have a society that's becoming more and more dependent on technology. That technology itself is becoming more and more vulnerable. And we also have, correspondingly, uh, or coincidentally, a an adoption of technology into a huge plethora of what used to be traditional uh, mechanical devices. That's right. That's um, right. Or electrical devices. All electro all electrical devices are becoming electronic devices. That's right. You can't buy a toaster or a washer or a dryer that doesn't include microcircuits now. There's just hardly any left on the market. So even something that would have been completely invulnerable to EMP 30 years ago is now incredibly vulnerable to it. And that goes, for unfortunately, to a lot of other things that preppers depend upon, like charge controllers uh, for their off-grid power systems. Right. And, uh, and it's just... The list, unfortunately, keeps getting longer and longer. And to intentionally detach yourself from that level of technological abstraction is becoming harder and harder. Mm-hmm. You have to consciously almost go you know, full Amish or full Luddite to detach yourself from that technology. It is remarkable. I'm, our, uh, we've had various members of the uh, Layman's family on, Galen, Galen Layman, the CEO mm-hmm. of Layman's Hardware, and uh, Linda uh, Layman, his, his sister, have been on. And um, they've talked to us about, uh, th- about the way that their family has been for over 60 years providing non-electric and electric-free living options for people. And when I first saw the catalog, um, it just was a real eye-opener for me because going through page after page of things that you can do without electricity, 
if you have the right tools is it's really refreshing it's like it kind of restores your you, you sit up a little straighter and you go yeah i'm not i'm not a uh, subservient you know a dependent slave to all this stuff i could because the opposite absolutely happened the last time we put in uh you know some of our more, more recent like you try to get a, a printer or various things um even our uh some of our appliances as you mentioned now they want to they want to they you know they ask if they can get on your uh local wi-fi network or whatever it's like no i don't i i put you in to be a servant to me not to not to sit there and <laughs> check up on me and keep you know decide when you want when you order ink from uh, hp for yourself and and clean yourself whenever you feel like it. and they're like no i i'll tell you when i want you to do something you know you're used to a tool being being something that that you are you are the master of not vice versa yeah, I'm I'm much more of a uh, uh, a laundry drying rack and hand scythe kind of a guy, uh-huh. well, rather than uh, the the absurdity of some of this just drives me crazy. Like you can no longer buy most software on oh, oh, a, right. a CD or DVD. Yeah, right. Can't so if yeah. you want to install it on your computer, you need to have an internet connection. Right. And uh, and for someone like me, who, uh, you know, I'm really blessed to to have access to satellite internet. But if it weren't for that, I live in such a remote area that I would be on 56k dial-up, and it might take <laughs> hours or days to download a new operating system for for a computer. By the time you do the download, it would be an obsolete version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, again, this level of abstraction. I think is going to be one of the things that might come back and bite us. Well, I thought we were, where you're going with this might be, and and I and I haven't heard you say this specifically, but it's basically it's a learned helplessness that comes from really losing the practical yes. skills that all these tools are supposed to help augment. You know, people say like when you people who have become blind, their hearing gets much sharper, or vice versa, or whatever. But it's like we just keep getting dumber. We keep we keep feeling smarter uh, because we have we have these. Um, these uh, bionic tools we carry around with us on our hip to we can look up anything that was ever researched by the right, human yeah, come on, i got the answer right here no one have to ever wonder anything never get lost i got gps but it's like having a research librarian on your hip yeah and and uh, davy crockett to help you find where you're going but meanwhile yeah. you can't read a map right. because it's just like when we were doing home births uh, the lay midwives were informing us that you know they had these special stethoscopes that could connect to their foreheads and they lean against the mom's uh, belly and, and they could hear the baby's heart be much, much younger age uh, than an ordinary stethoscope. And yet they say, well, you know, you go to a clinic and they're only going to use uh, the Doppler ultrasound, and nobody's proven that that's safe for the for the little the little forty thousand eggs that are in in already in the. Uh, the ovaries of the developing female, uh, you know, fetus, uh, to be bombarded with that kind of uh, energy, that sort of thing. But but it doesn't matter because the nurses these days are only being trained on how to, and the obstetricians are only being trained on how to use that that technology. and wouldn't right. even know how to use this the older you know non uh, electronic means. And the same thing now we go to get your health checked at the clinic and they put the little automatic blood pressure cuff on you and they don't even pay any attention because the machine's going to do it all now for them. So those skills, <laughs> it's like use it or lose it. And that's yeah. where I thought you were going to go with this was we're, we're just going to become even more helpless uh, than we are. Well, I'm afraid I'm afraid we are. And the the level of, of technological abstraction is, is increasing progressively. And our level of detachment from the land, unfortunately, right. for the average American is is becoming greater and greater you know there's a luckily there's a countervailing movement but it's small and uh, you know I'm, I'm a Christian and I often say the remnant will be small yeah. well the technological remnant will be small as mm -hmm. well yeah um, and uh, the number of people who are likely to pull through a grid down collapse in America that lasts through two winters is getting smaller and smaller with every passing year and it's not just medical device or pharmacological dependence it's just common sense and the ability to to do things the old-fashioned way people have, are just losing basic skills and you take your average urbanite or suburbanite and ask them to field dress a deer or plant a garden or even just kindle a fire yep and they're completely lost mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I read. Uh, I was sorry. I was watching a show about uh, engineering in general, and we've been talking about very elevated levels of technological engineering. But at, at the very simplest forms, uh, the country that's the most famous for having you know world class engineering is is Germany, and they're talking about how uh, mechanical engineering students in Germany spend the whole first year in their metal in their um, metalworking uh, labs just using files. They're using dimensional measurements. And then filing and filing and filing and filing blocks of metal and measuring them again and filing. because the file with its little tiny inclined planes for removing layers of material is the basic uh, tool sure. on which all yeah. other metalworking tools are based. Whether it's a whether it's a drill, you know, it has that same plane at the front of it, or whether it's you know a computer numerically controlled CNC machine or whatever, they all start with that same basic. And it and it's that physical hands-on experiential understanding of how this mater these materials interact with the the working of them and how that all comes together for for dimensions and tolerances and strength and everything like that and then then you start you can la add layers and layers of automation and mechanization on top of that but to accomplish what you already understand what you already know uh, at a physical level and so yep. I have no problem with but people you know learning how to automate something that they really do know how to do but it's the part where we just you just skip right over that that's that's obsolete now we just go straight to the i'm better at it now because i can just right. uh, the, the whole concept of, of a course like that being in the syllabus of a circa 1900 or 1920 engineering school would have been considered absurd because everyone going to an engineering school would have already had all the rudiments of you know how to operate a screwdriver and how to operate a, a hand plane and how to um, you know file metal and shape and form and uh, even cast metal all that would have been under their belt long before they went to engineering school now they have to backtrack and do all of that so uh, I think what you brought up is just one example that's a, a microcosm of a macro trend that we're seeing in society. All right. Uh, we have a, a society, unfortunately, worldwide that's becoming more and more urbanized. And for those who are out in the hinter boonies, our numbers are small, and uh, we have to recognize there is probably going to come a day when society might completely collapse, and it will be up to us to rebuild society from from square one uh, it, it's not going to be rebuilt from the top down it'll be rebuilt from the bottom up mm -hmm. and that'll be a slow painful process especially if the power grids go down and from a survival standpoint from the soil up right right it's it comes right down to calories <laughs> now, <laughs> the, the number of calories you could produce and the number of uh, the other uh, kilocalorie number to consider is the amount of firewood that you can yeah. cut by hand, haul by hand, split by hand, stack by hand, and feed into your fireplace or your wood stove by hand, um, that's a caloric equation. Mm -hmm. And most people have not really thought that through. And even most advanced preppers really don't even have uh, a traditional traditional axes or hand saws for felling uh, mm -hmm. and for uh, handling cordwood. They're dependent on their chainsaws. And if there's no gasoline available, that chainsaw is going to look pretty silly. If we could turn this completely around now and go to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, things that are so not physical that they're, they are only virtual, and that's uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, okay. A number of our listeners will it's it's like hot and cold it's like the parting of the red seas when we do or don't bring up cryptocurrencies we get uh, people feeling very hot under the collar about it either way so here we go um could you weigh in on what uh guiding principles you're seeing what, what important trends you're seeing around the topic of cryptocurrencies and uh preparedness or you know getting ready for the next the next wave of what's going to be changed in our paradigm because certainly people are seeing sure. a paradigm shift coming well, um, I guess first and foremost, uh, I am a believer in cryptocurrencies, but in a very small way. And secondly, uh, I need to 
add the caveat that I think within five years, we're going to see most cryptocurrencies as we currently know them go away. Sure. And to be replaced by a blockchain currency technology that will be controlled and fully tracked and fully taxed by governments. Yep. Governments can cannot abide by the whole concept of people transacting their business in a currency that's completely opaque to them. Mm -hmm. That's why they want to have an electronic currency and preferably a blockchain-based currency that they have complete tracking, womb-to-tomb tracking of every uh, token that's created. They want full control of that. And uh, I got involved with Bitcoin very early on, back when I was literally mining Bitcoin on my laptop computer. And in one week, I could mine almost one whole Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, nowadays, that re that would require a warehouse full of uh, very high-speed processors running like <laughs> flat out <laughs> uh, just to create a fraction of a Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's uh, things have changed very radically since those days, and. Uh, I actually lost track of my Bitcoin for a while, and I even had to hire some help to help me recover uh, a Bitcoin wallet, which um, had a, uh, a glitch. And uh, I recently cashed out of all of my Bitcoin, not but through a, currency, a cryptocurrency exchange, but literally spending it with firearms parts uh, and ammunition and gun dealers. Um, I was trading virtual for as physical as you can get. Yeah. And uh, the reason being is I think that uh, the efficacy of Bitcoin will begin to drop when they, right now they're at about 90% of it being mined out. And it's just standard practice for the Bitcoin miners that when it becomes no longer cost competitive, to mine a particular currency to switch to another. I think a lot of them are switching over to Ethereum right yep. now. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that as they shift away from mining Bitcoin, that's going to slow down the, the blockchain for uh, tallying the transactions in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And once Bitcoin starts to slow down, it'll fall out of favor. And right now, a Bitcoin transaction can be cleared in just a few minutes. What if it gets to the point where it takes two or three days to clear a transaction? People aren't going to be able to walk into Starbucks and buy a <laughs> double latte grande with whatever um, using Bitcoin anymore. So obviously, I think Bitcoin is on its way out, and I think it'll be replaced by other cryptocurrencies. But again, within five years, I think we're going to see the evil hand of government step in and attempt to corral all of it. And they'll make it illegal to deal in anything else other than a government sanctioned and monitored and taxed cryptocurrency. And I think that um, the, um, the opportunity to be in involved in cryptocurrencies as we currently know them is going to go away within five years. So where does that leave individuals who don't? I, I, you've you've given your own. You voted with your own feet, I guess. You've you've said I'm going to be out of this. Uh, yes, our, and get something family, really. We have less than one Bitcoin left, uh, in, in amongst our entire family, and um, I think that it, it still has a place in an investment an investment portfolio, but it's a very small place at this point, and I'm a big believer in practical tangibles that are barterable okay at like common caliber ammunition sure like silver and to a lesser extent gold and platinum uh, right now I'm big on both silver and platinum because they're both radically undervalued undervalued yeah versus gold platinum okay. is just yeah. at an insane ratio to gold right now so um, I'm a big believer in practical tangibles rather than Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. I would say my, my general advice that I've been giving my consulting clients is keep less than 5% of yeah, your net worth yeah. in cryptos. Mm -hmm. 
That's interesting. That's the same number that uh, Jerry Robinson, the author of uh, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, uh, was was reflecting as well. Was a five percent uh, holdings in cryptos. So it's I've heard, we've heard that from another as well. And uh, when you mentioned other uh, uh, non-perishable or key value barterables, other other things besides small caliber ammunition, and I think you mentioned some tools, useful tools, that sort of thing. Uh, yes, um, common caliber ammunition is top of my list. Uh, small silver okay. and um, practical hand tools uh, and just bulk foods. I think that um, any long term storage food is going to have great utility for barter if it's properly packaged, properly maintained in a, in a you know, uh, a cool, the, the classic cool, dry place. Yeah. Uh, that'll be that'll be much better than money in the bank. In fact, your money in the bank may be absolutely worthless. Right, right. Um, just on that point of food, are there any particular um, types of food that you think, um, uh, for some reason, hold uh, your attention in terms of uh, storable food? Well, uh, I, I like, like to pursue two different tracks. One is the, the bargain basement, low budget, do it yourself track, which is primarily using what's called a seven gallon super pail, which is a HDPE food grade plastic pail that you pack yourself. And mm -hmm. for that, you're packing things like wheat, rice, beans. Those can be packed yourself at very low cost. The, the cost per calorie, the cost per meal, however you want to break it down, is substantially lower than Anything you'll ever buy in the store, because you're buying it, you, you know, if you buy uh, pinto, bag, pinto beans in a one-pound bag, you're going to pay about 15 times as much per ounce for those beans as if you were to buy it in a 50-pound sack. And, and what do you do in terms of uh, moisture and oxygen control? You, you use a mylar liner for the bucket, and then you throw in a couple of oxygen-absorbing packets, and if you don't have access to that technology in my book, How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It, and at my uh, website, again, at survivalblog.com, I describe a dry ice method that will do the same thing. Um, that will basically displace all the oxygen yep. in that container, so the little critters can't, can't, there may be some little bugs in there, but they're not going to breed. They're going to die, and uh, they won't be, you're not going to have the, the horrible sensation of, of opening up a bucket of of uh, wheat and finding it just full of weevils. That just yeah. won't happen. Yeah. Right. But right. The, the unit cost is incredibly low that way. Now, if you've got a bigger budget, there are a number of brands on the market that provide 30 plus year shelf life mm -hmm. with foods that are nitrogen packed in number 10 cans. A number 10 can is just under a gallon and uh, the shelf life is, is just tremendous for those foods. But again, the, the unit cost is higher, so it's yep. it's the, it all comes down to the dollars to sweat ratio. If you're willing to take the time to do it yourself, your cost can be very very low, much lower than buying at a store. So even for the things that you use on a regular basis, it it's behooves you to to stock up and store them all yourself, and then rotate those foods regularly. We have been talking with Jim Rawls. He's the editor and founder of survivalblog.com. And uh, uh, Jim, before we, before we wrap this up, if there are any final words that you'd like to share, any final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience, you're, you've got the floor. Well, I'd just like to encourage your audience to dig deep into the references that are available on the Internet. My blog uh, is, is kind of the granddaddy of all prepper blogs, but... There are so many other fantastic resources out there. And like my blog, most of them are available free. Most of them have free archives that you can delve into. Print out the most important articles and start building yourself binders, reference binders on not just the manuals for every piece of equipment you have, but all your favorite recipes, techniques for you know building your own hand pumps, for just about anything. You'll find them in those blogs out on the internet. Take the time to do the research. Print out hard copies so you'll be EMP proof. If you take the time to do that, you will be miles ahead of your neighbors and you will be in a position to help your neighbors right. when they are completely lost and confused and have have no references of their own. 
the reason that I cracked up was because a, a famous author of the early 20th century, G.K. Chesterton, was asked uh, one of these stumper questions. People said, "If you were if you were lost for the rest of your life on an, on a desert island, what, and you could only take one book with you, what would it be?" And he thought just for a moment before it, he said, "I'd like Thompson's Practical Guide to Shipbuilding." <laughs> So, <laughs> so yeah, if you're going into a bad situation, make sure you have the right reference materials close at hand. So, <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. You always bring a deep well of insight uh, to get people's uh, thought process and their juices flowing. And we always uh, are glad for your presence here with us on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you so much for having me on. And I, I pray the 91st Psalm for you and all your listeners. Thank you.